are not many treatment options for floaters and even fewer good ones. Observe and wait for the brain to adapt kind of seems like a cop-out and may be a little too conservative for some, though this is the route most people will go and it does tend to work for a lot of them. Then on the other side of the spectrum, we have vitrectomy, where the gel is surgically removed from the eye, which may just seem too invasive and risky for others. So today I'm going to be focusing on something kind of in between those extremes, vitriolysis or laser treatment for floaters. Floaters are clumps of collagen or debris in the vitreous gel that fills the back and as light enters the eye, these floaters cause a shadow to be cast upon the retina, causing you to see annoying little moving objects in your vision. They sometimes look like bugs or even cobwebs, and they're more noticeable against a bright or plain background. They don't often affect visual acuity, which is measured by that eye chart in the doctor's office, but they do often affect visual clarity, contrast sensitivity, reading speed, driving, and even quality of life. In this video, I'm focusing on floaters that develop slowly over time and are age-related, which happen due to changes in the vitreous where it liquefies and condenses with time, as well as floaters caused by posterior vitreous detachments, where the vitreous detaches away from the back of the eye, which happens because of the aforementioned changes. For more background on these, see the links in the description. Laser vitreolysis works by using nanosecond pulses of laser to evaporate and dissect floaters. Using photochemical, thermal, thermal acoustic, and electromagnetic optical field effects, the solid floater is converted into a liquid and somewhat of a gas, and gas bubbles will float away and be absorbed into the bloodstream and leave the eye. But uh, unlike the vitrectomy procedure where the floaters are physically removed from the eye, these are zapped. So in this case, if a laser is fired at too low of an energy and does not cause the floater to evaporate, it can just break it into smaller pieces, which could just result in more floaters, which of course kind of defeats the purpose of the procedure itself. So that is an important distinction here. The floaters aren't being removed from the eye, but the goal is to evaporate them um, as successfully as possible. The clear benefit here is that no incisions are made in the eye, making the risk of complications much lower in this procedure compared to a vitrectomy. So we definitely want to look at how successful this procedure is at not just eliminating floaters, but reducing the symptoms that come along with them. The first randomized control trial that was done to test the safety and efficacy of this procedure showed not the greatest results uh, when you look at them objectively. They showed moderate improvement in symptoms in 36% of the participants, significant improvement in 2.5%, no improvement in 54%, and actually worsening symptoms in 8%. It is important to note that the older data that is out there shows moderate efficacy and some potential safety concerns. However, these studies were done at a time when the lasers were not yet optimized for the treatment of floaters. Fortunately, newer research is showing improvement in a greater number of participants, around 54 to 77%. But these studies tend to be small, and so I would love to see this corroborated by larger studies in the future. You may have seen my previous video about vitrectomies where the floaters are surgically removed from the eye, requiring incisions in the eye. And as you can imagine, this has a much higher risk of complications compared to vitreolysis, where a laser just zaps these floaters without needing to make any incisions in the eye and without manipulating the vitreous so much as the laser is able to focus on very small areas at a time. On the other side of that coin, vitrectomies are much more successful at improving symptoms, showing elimination or improvement in symptoms in 93% compared to that 54 to 77% range for vitreolysis that I just mentioned. I just think that it is so important though to emphasize that there is a much higher risk for sight-threatening complications with a vitrectomy compared to vitreolysis. So it's absolutely paramount that each individual weigh the pros and cons with their provider uh, over any of these procedures that they're considering and decide what is going to be best for them. Another good thing to keep in mind too is that vitreolysis can be repeated 
And if it is unsuccessful at improving symptoms, a vitrectomy could be a potential backup option. So let's get into some of the potential complications of vitriolysis. Even though no incision is made into the eye, and even though the laser is focused in a small point, there is still laser energy being put into the eye, and that can cause damage to some of the surrounding tissues, and that would include cataracts, a clouding of the lens, sometimes retinal bleeding, usually small areas that tend to be transient and heal on their own. There is also the potential for the intraocular pressure to raise, uh, which would be more of a concern for someone with glaucoma. There have been some cases where a trabeculectomy was required to improve the intraocular pressure. That's one of the surgeries that is done for glaucoma, though there was no clear causation proven, meaning that they can't pinpoint that it was due to the vitriolysis that this occurred. And the same goes for retinal detachments. Even though there have been some retinal detachments following vitriolysis, they haven't really been able to pinpoint that that was the true cause. The good thing is the risk of complications is very low, especially when you're comparing vitriolysis to vitrectomies. One study sought out to determine how bothered people are by their floaters by asking them questions like, how much of their life would they be willing to exchange to be rid of the symptoms of floaters? And the results of that were pretty surprising. They found that patients were willing on average to exchange 1.1 years out of every 10 remaining years of their lives to be rid of the symptoms of floaters. They were also willing to risk an 11% chance of death and a 7% chance of blindness to be rid of these symptoms. That just goes to show how bothersome floaters can be despite them not being considered a serious condition. So for those who are extremely bothered by them, these risks of complications may be a moot point for them and seem totally worth the risk. The goal of course is always to prevent and minimize the risk of complications and there are some ways to achieve that with this procedure. Some of those being to be sure that the laser is being used at the right energy level and also that the laser is aimed precisely at the vitreous opacities. Though this can be difficult because floaters float. Inherently, floaters float within the gel of the eye. So if there's the slightest eye movement, these can dart around. So keeping still during this procedure is of the utmost importance. But even so, it can be hard to target these opacities perfectly. For that reason, it is best to treat floaters that are far enough away from the lens of the eye and far enough away from the retina so that those areas are less likely to be damaged. That would include avoiding shooting floaters that are near the trabecular meshwork, which is an important part of the eye used to drain the eye's fluid and maintain proper intraocular pressure. Also limiting the number of laser shots that are used during any given treatment period can help to reduce the amount of energy put into the eye and reduce potential damage. Fortunately, the latest developments in lasers, optics, and illumination systems now allow the retina and the vitreous opacities to be in focus simultaneously, making treatments more accurate. So in order to select patients who will truly benefit from this procedure, specialists are guided by certain criteria. And those tend to include floaters that have been around for two months or more and are not showing significant improvement in that period of time. Also floaters that are two millimeters or more away from that lens and away from the retina. Also in order to warrant the procedure, floaters should cause an effect on quality of life to some degree, whether it's causing difficulties with reading, using a computer, driving, or causing annoyance, or affecting concentration. The bottom line is that floaters that are to be treated should be causing some persistent issue that is not resolving on its own. There is no reason to do this procedure on floaters that are not causing significant trouble. There are some contraindications or reasons that this procedure should not be done on floaters. And that would be floaters that are caused by recent or current underlying conditions like inflammation or retinal detachments. Another would be that the floater cannot be visualized or that the laser cannot be focused properly on the floater, whether that's because it's too far in the periphery or because of 
corneal or lenticular opacities. That could include corneal scars or swelling or an irregular lens shape, for example. Also, if there's high intraocular pressure or uncontrolled glaucoma, you don't want to risk the increase in intraocular pressure that may occur after the procedure. If the floater is too large and will require too many treatments, or if there are too many floaters, then the procedure may not be recommended. Another potential reason not to do this procedure would be on a person who suffers from some psychiatric problem that may recur or worsen if this procedure does not go according to plan, meaning there are complications or the symptoms do not resolve as expected. Let's consider the perfect scenario that would be the ideal person to go through a vitreolysis procedure to treat their floaters. That would be someone who has one or few large, dense floaters right in the center of the vitreous gel, not too close to the lens or the retina or the trabecular meshwork in the periphery, or perhaps someone who has a large floater as a result of a posterior vitreous detachment. Also, it would be great if there were no irregularities in the cornea or the lens, making it easy to focus on that vitreous floater. Fitting this perfect candidate profile is certainly difficult, and it's definitely not required in order to think of vitreolysis as a potential treatment option. Regardless, it is still worth treating this decision with the utmost respect, because there are always risks of complications and floaters, while they can be very bothersome, are not a sight-threatening condition in the sense that they can severely degrade vision or cause damage to the surrounding ocular structures if they go untreated. So is vitreolysis going to be worth it? Well, we've already discussed the risks versus benefits here and who may benefit versus who may not be the best candidate for this procedure. The important thing to keep in mind is that there is no perfect procedure that is going to give perfect results, especially to everyone every time. So that is definitely necessary to keep in mind while making this decision. Having a conversation with an individual's provider is important to choose what's going to work best for them and really deciding and determining how bothersome floaters are for you and how willing you are to potentially risk vision if you do happen to experience a complication. And those would include the vitreous floaters functional questionnaire and the visual function questionnaire. This really needs to be a decision made on an individual basis after a detailed discussion between a patient and their provider. Overall, it appears that vitreolysis is a safe and moderately effective way to improve the symptoms of floaters. And the good thing is it can be repeated and if it ultimately fails, vitrectomy could be considered. To learn more about floaters, including other treatment options, check out this playlist here and click here to learn more about vitrectomies. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to click to subscribe so you don't miss out on any videos about eye health tips and news. I hope to see you next time.